you know, we don't really have a functioning embassy in, in Russia anymore. We have this, what I describe as a Potemkin embassy, where it's a, it's a pretend embassy where the, the few diplomats that remain actually, you know, cling to their embassy lifestyle, very seldom leave, leave the building, can't speak Russian anyway, and spend all their time in secure video uh, conversations with policymakers in London, telling them that, what they want to hear. So, um, you know, if that's all the analysis that, that policymakers in London are getting about what's happening in contemporary Russia, then actually we're all slightly doomed. So partly it's just about the kind of the real erosion of our ability to analyze Russia, you know, and what's happening, you know, in terms of Russian policy, our disinvestment in diplomacy. It still seems to be the strategy, actually, of Western countries, including the UK, to keep this going, right? Uh, and like fight to the last Ukrainian, and exactly. and 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 fill in as much as uh, I mean, send as much uh, weaponry as you can to kill as many Russians as possible. Um, this is a horrible, horrible strategy, and it is horrible first and foremost for the Ukrainians, and secondly for the Russians. Um, can you explain to yourself, or did you? Did you ever meet the people who are responsible for this policy, and what is their what are their thinking, their thought processes going down that route? Because they must understand that this is what it's what it is, right? This is not just us putting a framing on them. That's actually that's actually a strategy of theirs, isn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, I've met many of the people who've made this uh, uh, policy. Uh, you know, I'm sad to say, but uh, uh, I think a lot of it is rooted in it's two things. Uh, it, it's one uh, that lots of the kind of Russia thinking in the government, including in uh, in the US government, in, in the UK government, is from people who've been thinking about Russia since, you know, the downfall of the, of the Soviet Union. They, they've been around so long uh, that their mindset is still in, you know, Soviet collapse, you know, Russia weakness, uh, and Russia still being a hostile threat because of the size of its, you know, nuclear arsenal. So, so they have a very strong and dominant role in terms of influencing how policymakers think, but also influencing how ministers think. You know, certainly in the UK system, our foreign ministers come and go. We've had seven foreign ministers, eight foreign uh, ministers, you know, since the Ukraine uh, crisis started. So, you know, because they're not as well informed as the officials, the officials have a lot of influence over how they think. That's one. The, the second is that actually the new generation of British diplomats We've lost our Russia expertise. You know, we haven't. We've stopped investing in in having new young diplomats coming through the system who are learning about Russia, understanding you know contemporary Russia, but also getting to know Russian people and understanding the Russian psyche, the Russian soul, you know how Russian people think, for the purpose of actually enabling us to have dialogue, diplomatic dialogue on the tough issues with Russia. So one, a dominance of the people who've been around since the kind of post-Soviet phase and still see Russia as this essentially malignant and hostile uh, throwback uh, from that from that period. And two, a generation of, of new diplomats who don't understand Russia anyway and just happy to, uh, happy to follow the kind of groupthink policy consensus. I think you're... This is an important point because time matters and generations matter. So on this channel, I had the privilege of talking to um, Jack Matlock yeah. two or three times. And this man is just utterly brilliant. And he's a U.S. foreign, uh, U.S. diplomat who comes from the middle, middle of the Cold War, early to middle Cold War. And yeah. he's one of the people responsible for negotiating the Cold War to an end. And now we have people in the highest offices in their 50s and 60s who were young and trained when Russia was uh, weak. And when everybody was in this uh, hyper kind of triumphalist, uh, we defeated yes. we defeated the Soviet Union moment. It, is that still in the head of these people who are now taking the, the decisions that that they are saying the Russians are evil, but they're also weak. Therefore, we fight to the end. Is that the idea? Uh, well, yes, uh, you know, for want of a better term. And there's also kind of a fear about, you know, Russia's. There's an exaggerated fear of, of the Russian threat. You know, Russia, you know, economically, you know, demographically, uh, militarily in terms of conventional military military power, you know, we've created a narrative that it poses an outsized threat to the reality. You know, um, firstly, uh, we're worried about, you know, Russia having greater alignment with, with China 
and what that means for U.S. interests, you know, in particular, and policy in, in the South China Sea, uh, even though China is massively the dominant partner in that kind of relationship, uh, and the and the Russia-China relationship is much more difficult than people really uh, kind of uh, appreciate. Uh, so, you know, you've got all these kind of exaggerated notions of A, Russia and its threat, and B, Russia and how it can, um, you know, can join with, with China to create an even greater kind of uh, global challenge uh, that people kind of use all the time to justify existing policy, which very clearly isn't working, particularly in Ukraine. Yeah, you're absolutely right. For anyone interested, there's this, this wonderful scholar. His name is Yu Bin, and he since 1999 he has been uh, producing quarterly uh, updates on the uh, Russia-China relationship. And there you can see then how 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 dynamic that one is. Um, the 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 thing that I cannot get over is something that you also write about in your book is the double speak that we see in Western uh, uh, media, but also coming from politicians saying that um, you know. Russia is a huge threat. We need to deter it. It's really, really dangerous, but it's also super weak. I mean, they can't, you know, they will fall quickly. And if we just send two or three marshes to storm shadows, then they're going to run yeah. home and there's going to be total defeat and the, the Ukraine's going to get back Crimea. Do they believe that? Do they have a schizophrenic psychology, these people? I think some people genuinely do believe that. I mean, because, you know, we've lost sight of analysis you know, we don't really have a functioning embassy in, in Russia anymore. We have this, what I describe as a Potemkin embassy, where it's a, it's a pretend embassy where the, the few diplomats that remain actually, you know, cling to their embassy lifestyle, very seldom leave leave the building, can't speak Russian anyway, and spend all their time in secure video uh, conversations with policymakers in London, telling them that, what they want to hear. So, um, you know, if that's all the analysis that, that policymakers in London are getting about what's happening in contemporary Russia, then actually we're all slightly doomed. So partly it's just about the kind of the real erosion of our ability to analyze Russia, you know, and what's happening, you know, in terms of Russian policy, our disinvestment in diplomacy. How are the Russians? Are they holding up better in terms of being able to understand what the UK and the Europeans are doing? Um, do you do you know how they operate their embassies in, in London and so on? Well, certainly the UK. I mean, certainly since 2018, uh, Russia's had a far better resourced embassy in the UK than we've had in, had in Russia. So their diplomatic assets, their ability to understand what's happening in the UK you know, is much greater. There, there's a, a much larger kind of Russian population in the UK than there is you know, British population, let's face it, in, in Russia. The, we have a, and I'm, I'm glad to welcome, I'm very much an open border sort of person. You know, we have 150,000 Russian people, you know, living uh, living in the UK, that is a resource, you know, as well in terms of their understanding of the UK. Um, so, you know, Russia's ability to understand us, I think, is, is far is far better than our ability to to understand them. But in any case, you know, um, Russia itself has become very entrenched in terms of its view of the West and and, and uh, conjuring up uh, and reaching into history to kind of create the West as this new external threat along the lines of obviously the Nazis of, of World War II, uh, which, you know, they just commemorated Victory Day just recently in Moscow, uh, but also kind of Napoleon and going back to the, the Swedes and the Lithuanians. And, you know, we're, we're just the modern incar incarnation of, of a new kind of external threat. And Putin very much uses that to kind of rally Russians uh, to his to his side. Yeah, and this is what this is what. Sorry for the blunt language, but this is what sucks so much. If everybody goes back to history and then says, "Well, uh, you know, uh, Putin is a new Hitler," and then the Russians say, "Like, yeah, the Europeans are the new Napoleons," and 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 so on, then yeah, yeah, then we are doomed to to conflict. But the the thing that I you know, before the war started in 2022, Vladimir Putin wrote an op-ed uh, in one of the big German newspapers in in uh, in 2021 for uh, I think it was also for Victory Day. And one of the important thing is that 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 the Russians, at least back then, and Vladimir Putin too, they were very careful of of distinguishing between the Germans and the Nazis. He constantly talked about the Nazis who were a threat and everything, but not about the Germans. Um, yeah. And I fear that we in, in Europe, we lose the ability to distinguish between real um, people who did horrible crimes back in the past. Um, and, you know, Stalin was one of them, but most of his crimes he actually committed against his own people, you know, uh, others as well. But 
and and now the the this this over bloated um, boogeyman that we make out of it. Um, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, well, yeah, I completely agree, and I think the lightning preacher to Hitler is deeply kind of uh, offensive. You know, yes. to not just to him, but to, to Russian people in general. You know, given the number of Soviet citizens who died, you know, during the Nazi attempt to kind of uh, conquer, you know, the Soviet Union up to 27 million people, 27 million people. I mean, it's an unimaginable figure of people who died through a totally pointless war, you know, prompted by Operation Barbarossa. So, you know, that that likeness is, but, you know, we live in all of these entrenched narratives, don't we? These really kind of negative stereotypes about Russian and Russian people, you know, obviously Russian stereotypes about us. I mean, it, you know, of course, you know, works, uh, works both ways. And I lived in Russia for four and a half years. With my young kids, my daughter was seven months old when when we arrived as a family, you know, in Moscow. You know, I found Russian people in most regards very warm and welcoming. Moscow was a very nice, you know, place to live. Obviously, you know, I got a lot of attention from the local intelligence uh, services as part of my job, but it's all perfectly manageable. And actually, I had a very pleasant uh, life and very very many happy memories of of, uh, of Russia. So. You know, these kind of negative stereotypes, which obviously get really elevated at a time of war, they become, you know, self-perpetuating while the war's happening. So all of these things we've been hearing about Russia, you know, for the past two decades must be true because look at what's happening in Ukraine. But, you know, we need to take a step back and actually say, well, let's let's talk, you know, to Russia and actually step back from conflict, get people to put down their weapons and say, well, how can we bring about peace? Because... I'm quite sure that Russia absolutely wants, you know, peace uh, just as much as, you know, ordinary people who are suffering all of these kind of terrible bombardments in Ukraine must also want peace. Um, so if we look, the uh, countries are not unitary actors. You worked for one of the agencies, the Foreign Office, which is just one of the actors who actually is in engaged in Russia policy, right? Then you have the intelligence agencies which are certainly very important but you have the prime minister's office and 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 others within that maybe first could you tell us who else is is pivotal for like decision making when it comes to uk russia relations and uh on the british side and b who of those institutions would you think has the most realist assessment and would push for war for toward de-escalation and conversely like who is who is the most hawkish in this constellation um, well, I'd say at the moment, uh, we've got a, a prime minister who's really only focused on electoral survival. So mm -hmm. I'd say like Rishi Sunak is not a very prominent sort of um, uh, actor. Uh, that puts much more emphasis into, you know, the foreign office uh, itself. So you Lord Cameron now, you know, who's in charge, who at the time when his prime minister was responsible for the UK being completely excluded from the Normandy format, let's be clear, mm -hmm. So there's a certain amount of him righting the wrongs of that. Um, and the Foreign Office is almost overwhelmingly kind of hawking, but given that it's a diplomatic institution, uh, you know, the Foreign Office is the really you know, hawkish body. If anything, I, I'd say it's kind of the UK military that are that are arguing for a much more kind of nuanced, you know, uh, view on this. They don't want us to go to war, you know, more than... Uh, Frankly, all day citizens of the UK would want us to go to war, given all that would entail, which, you know, obviously Medvedev has been threatening about recently with, you know, missile strikes uh, against UK assets outside of Ukraine. So, yeah, I mean, uh, for me, you know, the Foreign Office itself is is the real kind of bizarrely and ironically, uh, you know, the, the hawkish kind of mover in UK kind of policy making at a time when the Prime Minister is really only focused on on the domestic there is a good chance that the, the prime minister will not survive the next general election and that actually there's going to be a, a, a change of government, that the Labour is going to win. Yeah, uh, I don't harbor much more hope in, in Keir Starmer either, but um, do you know the shadow cabinet? Like, um, are they, do they have a different approach towards Ukraine? And No, I mean, they don't seem to have their own yet independent foreign policy. You know, in fact, Keir Starmer has just parroted you know uh, the line about well, let's spend two point five percent of GDP on uh, G, uh, GNI on on, on defence rather than two percent, and actually other bits of the Labour Party are saying, well, shouldn't we spend one percent of GDP on, on international affairs? 
you know, and focus on engagement rather than, you know, rather than sort of a military military power. So there are kind of uh, splits within the Labour Party, I think. But actually, under Keir Starmer's leadership, they've not wanted to do anything on foreign policy that shows them as as being different from the Tories. You know, I think they see a massive risk in saying, well, you know, maybe the Conservatives are wrong about Russia. I mean, that you know, Keir Starmer's just not going to take that risk, frankly, because he's so desperate to come, become Prime Minister, you know, that he won't do that. So, you know, the, I think the scope for there to be a, a different, initially at least, uh, foreign policy under Labour is, is quite slim. Mm -hmm. And they're also focused on, the, you know, really the, more the question of overseas development assistance. You know, this big cut to overseas development assistance that was... You know, initiated in 2020 under Dominic Raab and his foreign secretary from 0.7% to 0.5% of GNI. I think if they make any changes, that they'll probably be looking at that sphere more than necessarily changing tack on our disastrous policy on Russia. That leaves a pretty bleak uh, outlook for the prospects of peace. I mean, if nobody wants really push for peace, a realistic peace, if the only peace that people think about is... Uh, at least on the western side is a complete withdrawal of russia from all the territories that they have yeah. that they have occupied are occupied now and are still winning and then a, a a war criminal trial of mr putin if that's the vision of peace well then we're not going to get there <laughs> um do you see anything that would push people towards like waking up that if they continue this there might be a general escalation and even further escalation because it, it, well, there's think, a you know, tit for yeah, I mean, I think the big irony is is that the person who's said he's prepared to negotiate is Putin, but he's a person who needs peace the least, you know, because from his point of view, um, you know, the war is kind of slowly, inexorably moving in, in Russia's favour with small but consistent gains being made along, along the front line. So um, so, so for him, yeah, he, he can talk the language of being ready to negotiate, you know, because the strategy is very much kind of weighing on his side, but you know, I think I think the thing that would tip the balance in the West is if there's a more catastrophic uh, breakage of the line in, in Ukraine, a more kind of catastrophic kind of collapse and defeat militarily in, in Ukraine. Uh, not not that I think actually Russia you know, has ever wanted to conquer the whole of Ukraine, but you know, if the military situation in Ukraine should deteriorate even further, then I think even Biden uh, may have to you know reassess his failed policy just as he's had to do belatedly and also unsuccessfully in Israel and Gaza. Uh, but fail, failing that, and, uh, you know, I think we're waiting to to see, you know, we literally are in a lottery waiting to see who becomes the next US president because I, I do think for all of his weirdness and eccentricity, I, I think uh, Trump would probably be much more realist uh, than Biden, who's a uh, fantasist, it seems to me. Yeah, but uh, Trump just yesterday again said, even before taking office, if he was president elect, he would he would end the war in Ukraine, <laughs> and we all know yeah. that. Um, well, that might be an overpromise, but he definitely has has an idea of um, of how to pressure the Ukrainians into actually sitting down. Um, yeah, because I mean, Ukraine has to be ready to negotiate too. And Russia yeah. has to be ready to negotiate. I mean, ultimately, peace will be sold by Ukraine and Russia in the final analysis. Yes. You know, Russia can have support from China and other countries. You know, obviously Ukraine will be supported by you know, the Western family and all that sort of thing. But without Ukraine and Russia sitting at the table together, there will be no peace. And yeah. that involves us having difficult conversations with Ukraine. That actually, well, this idea of peace conferences where Russia isn't invited is a completely ridiculous you know, you actually need to sit down with Russia as you did at the start of the war, going back to the Istanbul process and, and hammer out hammer out a process, you know, towards peace. If the West isn't is refusing to encourage Ukraine to do that, then then I think you know we're in real trouble because Ukraine will continue to think that it has a blank check, you know, for its for its actions. And not just not just Ukraine, but the thing is, I, I guess the Western alliance would need to strengthen the 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 the, the hand of the actual government of Ukraine and protect also the uh, Zelensky and others from the ultra right wing nationalists who would probably uh, kill these people just in order to continue the war. Um, I mean, yeah. you need to the, the old right uh, ultra right wing. They're small, but they're there, and they're threatening violence toward like to continue the war. Yeah, of course. And of course, you know, that that just makes 
Zelensky look increasingly like a puppet. <laughs> it doesn't, well, it? you know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, uh, so, you know, what do you do? I mean, uh, you know, Zelensky has to be a statesman. I think, you know, a war is a game of good, a game of two halves. I mean, his first half was good. You know, he he played the statesman right at the very beginning. He's got international uh, claim, but he needs to kind of flex, you know, and and recognize the realities of the situation his long-term kind of survival as a political leader. You know, he's already kind of delayed elections in, indefinitely while war war goes on. You know, he now needs to play the statesman and look at the bigger interest of his country. Do you think as a diplomat that um, Zale Mr. Zelensky could negotiate peace? Like, let's say, hypothetically, he came out of this persona that was created and he laid down the the, the green sweatshirt and put on a suit and re rescinded that decree that he cannot negotiate with Mr. Putin. If that happened, do you think he would have the standing inside Ukraine to actually negotiate and and bring Ukraine along with him? Um, well, possibly not, because, you know, so many people have left Ukraine, <laughs> you know, um, that actually what's left? You know, you've got people in the military, you've got you've got old people and you've got political activists, you know, many of yeah. whom are sort of, you know, now moving against Zelensky as they see that, you know, the war is very much... Uh, going against Ukraine, uh, not just uh, tactically, but longer term, you know, as well. But I mean, that that's politics. You know, uh, leaders come and go, and and you know that's that's his destiny. But if he's genuinely interested in peace, and he needs to kind of spin that drum and see where he ends up. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, that's why he's paid the big bucks. Politicians come and go, but that's why we have foreign offices. The diplomats they stay. At, yeah. Usually, do the Ukrainians have? people that you would say these are good people like they can work with the russians they can work with the brits with the americans is there a network still yeah no of course there are of course there are. i mean diplomats will ultimately you know diplomats were hardwired to engage you get the kind of more hawkish diplomats you get the more dovish diplomats you know like me but there would undoubtedly be you know people who, who recognize that actually you know engagement is vital you know for the future i mean you can't you can't do without it i mean um, but wh whether they whether they get their voices heard, of course, is another matter because clearly they don't, you know, in the UK right now. But uh, so so you know we'll see. Uh, but there, there's a it seems to me there's a big statesmanship vacuum in Ukraine right now uh, that, that Zelensky isn't filling. And uh, you know while while that remains, all this chaos and as you say this kind of greater influence of the kind of far right groups, you know, will only increase. So, you know, the longer Zelensky leaves it, I mean, the, the greater the chance of, of actually uh, it leading to quite a bad end for him politically, it seems to me. So, uh, you know, his best bet would be to strike out early and actually play the statesman now rather than wait and, and have a, it seems, you know, um, a much more kind of difficult political ending to his career. Yeah. And like, let's be honest, like an Afghanization of Ukraine cannot be in the interest of Ukraine. So any sane leader would try to avoid that scenario, no. right? No, I mean, I, I've been to Ukraine. You know, Kiev was, uh, is, you know, a fabulous city. I, I traveled, I mean, when I finished my time in Moscow, I drove all the way from Moscow back back to the UK, mm -hmm. you know, driving through kind of Chernihiv and down through Kiev and all across the you know, Western Ukraine through Lviv and so on. You know, real sense of a country, you know, looking forward you know, looking to integrate economically more with other countries, you know, up and coming, lots of potential, massive challenges, corruption, all those things we, we know about, but a real optimism to to open up and cast off, you know, the shackles of the past. Well, all that progress has come to a halt. I mean, you know, that, that can't continue while war rages. Uh, so, you know, it, it does feel like it's, it's you know, a country that's stuck in this kind of, this free zone imposed imposed on it by its its political leadership yeah, the, and the, the their determination that... to kind of stick with this hardwired narrative that they're you know it's becoming increasingly too late for them to change. The the thing that I worry about is that something that these that I've heard from these neocon corners is that okay even if Russia keeps winning more and more territory and because that's not really what Russia wants but let's 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 force Ukraine into them and then let's 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 funnel more weapons into a partisan war into little little, little pinprick uh, uh terrorist attacks and then you know it took uh it took 10 years but after 10 years the Soviet Union had to withdraw from Afghanistan i mean this is the kind of planning that i see some people doing and that would be absolutely horrible because it would make everything even more bloody and the russians need to avoid that at any cost which is why i think mr putin would want to 
uh, negotiate to to prevent that from happening. But do you have any? Do you is that a, a scenario that you also saw people talk about? Yeah, I, mean, I just don't know why anybody would think that was a good idea. You know, really. I mean, you know, good for us. You know, is a peaceful Ukraine that's integrating more closely in, into Europe. That's you know having good relations with Russia. You know, what why we think. You know, you look at how badly our, you know, the US-Afghan strategy worked out, you know, um, uh, you know, recently. Why we think that would be a good approach for th this country that wants to modernize, open up and integrate with the wider world. You know, you know turning it into sort of a neo-Taliban with you know, ultra right wing elements to it would be a good idea. Completely astounds me. I mean, you know, I should think most ordinary Ukrainian people want to just live in peace have their kids happy, you know, doing well at school and and have ordinary lives and so on. So it's just utterly ridiculous that people should think in these terms and not think that actually the best interest for everybody, Ukraine, Russia, you know, Europe, the UK, because we're still part of Europe, uh, you know, would not be served by peace. It's completely ridiculous. I absolutely agree. You speak like a real diplomat, like all diplomats should. So, um, Mr. Ian Proud, thank you very much for talking to me today. Thanks so much, Pascal. Nice to talk to you. All the best.